Thela Ransom Kuti called himself Abami Idu, which translates as the weird one or the strange one. He also took the surname Anakalupu, which translates as I have death in my pocket, meaning I will decide when death takes me. One of his managers called Kuti a tornado of a man. He was arrested more than 200 times for speaking truth to power and beaten countless times. And controversially, Kuti was a polygamist who at one point married 27 women all on the same day. These are just a few facts that illustrate the monumental outlandishness of Fela Kuti, which means that some people are still not sure whether to regard him as a madman or a saint. What is for sure is that Kuti was a global icon, a pan-Africanist, and a political activist and a revolutionary who spoke up for the poor and oppressed. He was also someone with an extraordinary appetite for dope and, well, women. Fela Kuti was a larger-than-life figure, one of the most important and influential African musicians of the 20th century. For this reason, he is sometimes called Africa's Bob Marley. Kuti was one of the first to blend Western African music, mostly from Nigeria and neighboring countries, with Western styles like jazz, rock, funk, and also Caribbean music, in particular reggae. In doing so, he created an entirely new genre, which he called Afrobeat. Kuti released several dozen albums during his lifetime, most of them during an extraordinary explosion of creativity during the 1970s. The tracks on these albums tend to be between 10 and 20 minutes in length, sometimes as long as 45 minutes. With Kuti refusing to create shorter tracks and also refusing to play songs live that he'd already recorded, he was a nightmare to promote for record companies. All this was a major factor in him not becoming a best-selling global superstar. Despite this, his influence has reached out into all corners of the music world. Kuti's 1970s band, called Africa 70, has been described as one of the best and tightest bands in history. When James Brown toured Nigeria in 1970, his band went to see Kuti perform. Brown's bassist, Bootsy Collins, remarked, they were the funkiest cats we've ever heard in our life. We were totally wiped out. Paul McCartney visited Lagos two years later in 1972 and also went to see Kuti and his band play. He recalled, they were the best band I've ever seen live. I just couldn't stop weeping with joy. It was a very moving experience. McCartney asked Cootie if he could do some recordings with a few of his musicians, but Cootie refused, accusing McCartney of stealing black man's music. The legendary Brazilian musician Gilberto Gill has quoted Cootie as a foundational influence, and the talking heads Magnum Opus Remain in Light in 1980 was directly influenced by Kuti's funky polyrhythms, as was Brian Eno and David Byrne's classic album, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, in 1981. In this century, Kuti's legendary 70s drummer, Tony Allen, worked extensively with Damon Albarn and the Gorillas. Musicians from Miles Davis to Beyonce have name-checked Kuti as a major influence, and it will be difficult today to find a serious musician who does not owe a huge debt to Kuti whether they are aware of it or not. In this video, we'll explore his life and music and what made him and his music so great and why he is still relevant today. Alu Fela, Alusagon, Alodutan Ransom Kuti was born on October the 15th, 1938 in Abeokuta, a large city in southwest Nigeria. The first thing to note is that Kuti came from a family of famous Nigerians. In fact, the Ransom Kuti family has been described as the Kennedys of Nigeria. This helps explain his enormous influence on Nigerian society, and his elite background most likely later saved his life on many occasions. Kuti's paternal grandfather, Josiah Jesse Ransom Kuti, was a clergyman and a composer who achieved fame for fitting Nigerian music to Christian hymns and making the first Yoruban song recordings. Kuti's father, Reverend Israel Eludatan Ransom Kuti, was an Anglican priest, a human rights campaigner, and the first president of the Nigeria Union of Teachers. 
and played a significant part in setting up the Nigerian educational system. Kuti's mother, Chief Fumalayo Ransom Kuti, was an educator, unionist, political campaigner, women's rights activist, and she received the Soviet Union Lenin Prize in 1970. Kuti's cousin, Voile Soyinka, was the first black African writer to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Kuti's two brothers became well-known in Nigeria as human rights activists and doctors. Fela started his musical career on the piano at the age of nine. He also became the leader of the school choir. Combined with the backgrounds of his father and grandfather, it meant that his foundation was in religious music, something that was reflected in the transcendent and euphoric nature of much of his later music. In 1958, when he was 19, Fela's family wanted him to study medicine. But because he was not an academic high flyer, he managed to persuade them to allow him to attend Trinity College of Music in London, where he studied trumpet. It's this experience that probably led him to give the surprising answer when a journalist many decades later asked him for his favorite musician, George Frederick Handel. Western music is Bach, Handel, and Schubert. It's good music, cleverly done. As a musician, I can see that. Classical music gives musicians a kick, but African music gives everyone a kick. Kuti wasn't only fascinated by Western classical music, but also by jazz and funk, and his own African musical heritage. He'd chosen to study the trumpet because it was the instrument played by the leaders of Nigeria's most famous highlife bands, like Rex Jim Lawson and Victor Olaya. The resolutely optimistic highlife genre, with its rolling rhythms, had originally come out of Ghana, but eventually spread to many West African countries. However, while highlife was a strong influence on Kuti during his teenage years, it was his discovery of jazz trumpeters Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie that further galvanized his decision to study the trumpet and to explore jazz. In 1959, Kuti started a band called Fella Ransom Kuti and his High Life Rakers in London, which recorded four tracks for the Mellow Disc label. He then formed the band Kula Lobitos with West African and Caribbean musicians. They played, unsurprisingly, a mixture of jazz and high life. Kuti graduated in 1962 and returned to Nigeria in 1963. He initially set up a jazz ensemble called the Fellow Ransom Kuti Jazz Quintet. Two years later, it morphed into a group called Fellow Ransom Kuti and his Kula Lobitos, which again blended high life and jazz. One of the musicians he recruited was drummer Tony Allen, who would for many years be the most influential member of his band and who is regarded as a co-founder of Afrobeat. Kula Lobitas became quite popular in Lagos, but Kuti was still trying to find his musical direction. In search of new inspiration and to reacquaint himself with his high-life roots, Kuti traveled to Ghana in 1967. He encountered one major inspiration there in Sierra Leone native, Geraldo Pino, and his band, The Heartbeats. They were popular in Ghana and Nigeria and blended funk with high life. From this, Kuti further developed his own style, combining high life with funk, soul, jazz, Afro-Latin styles, and traditional Yoruba music. He called the new direction Afrobeat. He returned to Nigeria later in 1967 and started playing with Kula Lobitos at a club he founded in Lagos, Afrospot. A compilation album of Kula Lobitos recordings was released in 1968. It's high life time. Good morning time. Thank With the Biafran War ravaging the south of the country, Kuti and his band left for a 10-month tour of the US in 1969. He met Black Panther and civil rights activist Sandra Smith, now Sandra Isidore. She had a profound impact on him by introducing him to the writings of black activists like Malcolm X, Angela Davis, Jesse Jackson, and many others and educating him on social and political issues. This soon was reflected in his lyrics, in many of the life choices he made, and in his decision to incorporate more African elements in his music. During the months they spent in the US, Kuti renamed his band Nigeria 70, and selections from a series of concerts at the Citadel de Haiti on Sunset Boulevard were released in Nigeria in 1970 as Fela 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 and re-released worldwide in 1993 
under the name the 1969 Los Angeles Sessions. The album contains the first Afrobeat recordings by Kuti, albeit in an embryonic form, containing relatively short songs, sounding like a mixture of High Life and James Brown. The horn arrangements are funk influenced, rather than the Latin sounding horns in High Life, and the beat was deeper with Alan mixing High Life, jazz, and R&B in his drumming. Kuti sang in a more declamatory style, typical of African music, and some of his lyrics address social issues. For example, Viva Nigeria is a protest song against the Biafran War. Let's live together in peace. Fela Kuti and his musicians returned to Nigeria in 1970. During the first half of the 70s, many essential developments in his career happened in quick succession. Kuti renamed his band Africa 70, and he and the ensemble took Nigeria by storm, with an avalanche of best-selling albums that were both politically and musically revolutionary. By 1972, Kuti and his band had become big stars in Nigeria. Kuti set up a commune in Lagos that included a recording studio. He dropped Ransom from his name, as he regarded it as a slave name, and replaced it with Anikulapu, he who carries death in his pocket. In the same year, he also renamed his Afro spot club Africa Shrine. And it was here that Paul McCartney saw Cootie play live and met with him. Despite Cootie refusing to give McCartney permission to work with his musicians, the English musician recalled that the two became friends. Another famous British musician who made his way to Lagos around this time was drummer Ginger Baker. The two had met in London and Baker played alongside Tony Allen at Fela's London scene an album recorded at Abbey Road Studios in London in 1971. When Baker visited Lagos, he also worked with Kuti on Why Black Men Day Suffer, recorded in Arc Studio in 1971. It was the title track of his album that moved McCartney to tears. Why black men they suffer today. Kuti and Africa 70 recorded several more albums in 1971. Napoy had strong funk influences and lyrics so sexually explicit that the album was banned by Nigerian radio. Open and Close has been described as a trance-inducing groove fest. There was a live album called Well, Live, a 1978 reissue of the live album included a drum duet of Ginger Baker and Tolly Allen recorded in Berlin in 1978. Kuti's extraordinary creative peak continued in 1972 with the album Shakara and Rofel Rofel Fight, and in 1973 with Gentleman and Aphrodisiac. Gentleman has been credited as being his first fully formed Afrobeat album. Aphrodisiac was again recorded at Abbey Road and contains Kuti's biggest hit in Nigeria, Jean Coucou, a satire of gluttony. Not long after its release, Brian Eno bought Aphrodisiac in a London record shop on a whim, and he had no idea who Fela Kuti was. Eno later stated that it sounded to him like music of the future, and that it changed his life. He used the album to introduce countless people, including the talking heads, to the music of Kuti. There indeed are strong echoes of the album on Remain in Light. Almost all albums recorded by Kuti and Africa 70 from 1973 until the end of the 70s are today regarded as classics and fully released expressions of his Afrobeat direction. However, in captions written by Afrobeat historian Chris May that are part of the album videos on the Fela Kuti YouTube channel, the opinion is expressed that the band leader's true purple patch with his most mature Afrobeat occurred from 1974 until the dramatic events of 1977, when his commune was burnt down by the Nigerian army. During these three years, Kuti did indeed, as the caption state, tore it up in a rush of creativity, releasing a stunning 23 albums with new material. These albums include tour de forces like Alec Bon Close and Expensive Shit, with lyrics references Kuti's Wrongful Imprisonment in 1974, and Confusion, Kalakuta Show, Ikoye Blindness, Unnecessary Begging, Upside Down, Yellow Fever, and Zombie. Kuti's fully realized Afrobeat was performed by a large ensemble, with the leader himself on vocals, electric piano, 
organ, and tenor, and alto saxophone. The brass section could consist of up to three trumpeters and one or more saxophonists. There could be up to three guitarists, a bassist, Tony Allen on drums, up to five percussionists, and sometimes as many as 10 female backing vocalists. The rhythms were essentially African, with high life and Yoruban foundations, but also with powerful funk influences and elements of calypso, reggae, and jazz. Tony Allen was strongly influenced by jazz drummer Max Roach. The guitars and bass would play interlocking two-bar phrases a lot of the time, creating a complicated, multi-layered mosaic of rhythms. The brass section either contributed to the rhythm or would play melodies or riffs, often in call and response with Cootie's singing, as did the backing vocalists. Vamps and melodies would often be modal. Cootie's long-form songs would often introduce the instruments one by one after which there would be long introductory sections. Various instruments would then jam and solo, including Kuti on saxophone or a keyboard. The vocals would often not come in till halfway through the track. When Kuti was once asked why he used the long form, he again referenced Western music, replying, Bach and Beethoven did not play short. By the early 70s, Kuti was singing mostly in pidgin English, or broken English so his lyrics could be understood all over Africa. His lyrics became more and more explicitly and aggressively political, increasingly threatening and taunting the military dictatorship in Nigeria. This all boiled over after he released Zombie at the end of 1977, which was his most explicit attack on the military yet. The album was banned from the radio, but it was hugely popular among the population. Nigeria was under military dictatorship during the 70s and 80s, and the Nigerian oil boom contributed to an explosion of widespread corruption, while most of the population remained poor. Life under the military dictatorship was extremely difficult for ordinary people, whose lives and freedoms were at the mercy of soldiers they encountered every day. Kuti was one of the few who had the standing and the courage to criticize the dictatorship, and for this reason, he was very popular with the population. However, he was a thorn in the side of the authorities and raids on his house and arrests and beatings were commonplace. On top of this, Kuti's commune became more and more difficult for the military to accept. Kuti had decided to call it Kalakuta, a mockery of a prison cell called Calcutta, where he had been locked up in 1974 and declared the commune a republic independent from the Nigerian state. It was a grand statement because Kalakuta was nothing more than a large house where perhaps 200 people lived. But after the trauma of the Biafran War, which was in part the result of Biafra trying to secede, it was yet another provocation that was unacceptable to the military. They were looking for an excuse to close down the commune. The lyrics of the title song of the zombie album, which mocked soldiers for slavishly following orders, was the last straw. The military's response was vicious. On February the 18th, 1,000 soldiers descended on Kalakuta, beat and forcibly evicted everyone and set the house on fire. Kuti's club, the shrine, was also destroyed, and he was nearly killed. The event gathered international headlines and outrage. More consequentially and painfully for Kuti than the injuries he sustained was the fact that his mother was thrown from a first floor window. She died soon afterwards from her injuries. Kuti had become very close to his mother and had come to rely on her for many of his decisions, while her political engagement and opinions would often inspire his lyrics. Kuti was deeply distraught and perhaps also racked with guilt, as it was his provocations that had triggered the attack. One of his responses was to parade a coffin in front of the military barracks in Lagos, resulting in a severe beating of him and those who came with him. He also wrote protest songs like Coffin for Head of State and Unknown Soldier about the killing. The year after the event, Kuti married 27 women, many of them associated with his band, in a move that sat uneasily with the feminism of his mother. The excuse was that marriage protected the women from persecution, and he later divorced them. However, he did keep a harem of 12 women. He also made rather sexist public declarations about the role of women in marriage 
in part in an attempt to come to terms with the dramatic and painful events of February the 18th, 1977, Kuti continued recording a string of albums. He changed the spelling of the band's name to Africa 70 with a K. And the albums he released during this time include No Agreement, Sorrow, Tears and Blood, Shuffering and Smiling, Stalemate and Unknown Soldier. The latter album contained only the title song with lyrics like Them Throw My Mama, 78-Year-Old Mama, Political Mama, Ideological Mama, Influential Mama, Them Throw My Mama Out of the Window, Them Kill My Mama. Make you not go anywhere, just wait till they make I tell you something. Kuti also lost most of his money in the raid of 1977 so he eagerly accepted an invitation to perform at the Berlin Jazz Festival in 1978 with the offer of a six-figure fee. The Berlin concert, which was professionally shot on video, was a triumph, but also the end of Africa 70 and Kuti's association with Tony Allen. According to Allen, musicians had not or barely been paid for many months, and the band, technical crew, and management added up to 28 people, which made touring expensive enough. When they found out that an amazing 71 people went to Berlin, many of the musicians left after the concert. There was also rumors that Kuti wanted to use the concert fee to fund a presidential campaign he wanted to start. He did indeed form the movement of the People Party in 1979, but it was suppressed by the military. His attempt to run for president in 1983 was rejected. Still grief-stricken by the death of his mother, Kuti spent a considerable amount of time trying to contact her via spirit mediums and seances, and stepped further and further into the world of African spiritualism, which included fascination with Egyptian mysticism. Kuti formed a new band, Egypt 80, which contained many young musicians. One of the resulting albums was Original Sufferhead in 1981, which describes another savage beating by the police that he had endured. Kuti drawing parallels with the callous treatment of ordinary Nigerians, which he called Sufferheads. Kuti appeared at Glastonbury in 1984, and that same year his album Army Arrangement was released though a slightly different version was released a year later. The reason for the two releases was that Kuti did not have direct control of the first release. The album had been recorded before he was arrested in September of 1984 on trumped up money laundering charges, and he ended up spending 20 months in prison. The debacle had been in part the result of an ill-advised association with a Ghanaian magician who called himself Professor Hindu. This was one of the results of Kuti's flirtations with African spiritualism that followed the death of his mother. And Hindu acted as a personal guru to the singer, often giving advice that made others tear out their hair. In this case, Hindu claimed to be able to make the money Kuti was carrying in his coat when he left Nigeria magically disappear the moment he went through customs. When the authorities found the money, which in fact was perfectly legal, it gave them the excuse to imprison Kuti on a spurious charge of illegally exporting foreign currency. Amnesty International took on Kuti's case and declared him a prisoner of conscience. His imprisonment became a cause celebre around the world that put him nearly on par with Nelson Mandela in terms of recognition as an African political prisoner. While Kuti was in prison, his record company believed that the army arrangement recording still needed work and asked the famous American producer and bass player Bill Laswell to finish them. Kuti was not impressed with the Western technology Bill Laswell added to Army Arrangement, with overdubs from legendary reggae drummer Sly Dunbar and Talking Heads keyboardist Bernie Worrell. A tape of the final result was smuggled into prison, and Kuti reportedly declared that listening to them was worse than being in prison. He later explained, It's not African music the way I hear it. I did not do music with computers and electronic gadgets because African music is natural sound. Laswell's version was released in 1984 and Kuti's original in 1985. Laswell's production has been called 
an act of gross cultural arrogance, that he has publicly defended his work and re-released his version of the album on Bandcamp in 2020. Kuti was released from prison in 1986, and in June, he appeared at Amnesty International's A Conspiracy of Hope concert in New Jersey, along with Carlos Santana, the Neville Brothers, and Bono. More albums followed, including Teacher Don't Teach Me Nonsense in 1986, with a slick Western production by Level 42 producer Wally Badaro, which Kuti did like. Kuti and Egypt 80 performed most of 1988 at the Shrine in Lagos, and a year later went back on tour internationally, which included shows with James Brown in New York. Kuti's next album, Beast of No Nation, was released in 1989. It had anti-apartheid and anti corruption themes. Kuti's last album of new material was Underground System, which was released in 1992. According to a former Egypt 80 musician, the music of Egypt 80 was straighter, more purposeful than the more circular and sensuous music of Africa 70. In Egypt 80, Kuti used music more as a weapon. The compositions also became more complex and more demanding to play. Kuti called it classical African music, Kuti's last releases also had a noticeably more produced and modern sound. As the 90s progressed, Kuti continued to perform, and the police continued to harass him. But he appeared increasingly in ill health, and there were rumors of him having a mystery illness. In fact, Kuti had AIDS, but refused to be tested, and he put his faith in African medicine. The subject of AIDS was taboo in Nigeria at the time. Kuti's brother, Olikoya Ransom Kuti made the announcement that the band leader had died from AIDS complications on August the 2nd, 1997. Nervous about how the news would be received in Nigeria, family was initially unsure how to handle the funeral. It turned out to be an astonishing event, with over one million people turning up to say farewell to Fela Anikulapu Kuti, the weird one who was carrying death in his pocket. No one knows whether Kuti, in fact, chose the moment of his passing. But what is for sure is that Miles Davis was not alone in calling him a life-transforming artist. The countless Nigerians who expressed their gratitude to Kuti during the funeral clearly felt he had changed their lives for the better. The same can be said for the many millions of musicians and listeners whose lives he touched with his Afrobeat fusion of many different music styles and the way he moved their bodies, hearts, and minds. Afrobeat has influenced countless musicians in pretty much all genres, from Branford Marsalis to Miles Davis in jazz, to Talking Heads, Paul Simon, Vampire Weekend, and Foles in rock and folk. Moreover, Kuti's sons Femi and Sean are still active Afrobeat musicians today. Afrobeat has become a strong influence on the short form and very different Afrobeats pop genre, which uses the latest music technology and is dominant in the charts today, with chart topping artists like Burner Boy, Kanye West, Drake, and many others, all incorporating elements in their music. Kuti and Afrobeat have left a powerful legacy and what has changed the world in many, many different ways. In so doing, Kuti fulfilled his purpose as a musician, which he once described like this. Music is supposed to have an effect. If you're playing music and people don't feel something, you're not doing shit. When you hear something, you must move. I want to move people to dance, but also to think. Music wants to dictate a better life. Wow. Uh, okay, so I knew Fela Kuti um, because of the talking heads. Because I read that Eno had played Fela Kuti to the Talking Heads, and you heard that record, and you knew it was so massively influenced by something that you had not heard before. I didn't know what Afrobeat was. I heard Eno talk about it, so that led me to go and buy Fela Kuti records. And if you've followed any of my other videos, it was yes, the the Notting Hill Record and Tape Exchange. I would go there and I'd buy absolutely everything. At that point in the early 80s, he must, I don't know how many records he had, but maybe I had 10 or 20. There was a lot of albums that were available. But it all culminated in 1984 uh, when I went to Glastonbury and pretty amazing. I'd never seen or heard anything like that in my life. And I don't think many people had. 
I don't know how many shows he'd played in the UK at that point, even though obviously in the early 60s he had studied in London and uh, was a, an accomplished trumpet player. I mean, an accomplished musician all around. Um, but I certainly wasn't alive then. And seeing him live was a truly spiritual experience because what you got to see is real musicians interacting with each other in something that can't really dis- be described in any kind of Western form whatsoever. And I, I mean, it was like seeing all those multiple rhythms actually work together because you would listen to the records and you get all your friends together and you'd be like, okay, cool, you're going to play this pattern, I'm going to play that pattern. And we could never make it work. To this day, I st- still don't know how it works. I feel like you have to grow up in that culture to really play it properly and understand how all of these different polyrhythms really can work together. It was a beautiful experience, but most importantly for me, the power of what he meant to so many millions of people. I read that line like four times, (laughs) a million people going to his funeral. I just can't think of There's not many people that have ever lived that could do that. And I think we just finish on that. I mean, it's just how important and powerful that he was a voice for his country for decades. I mean, he's over 200 recording beatings. It's ridiculous. It's insane. Music can be and has been really, really powerful and can really move people to do great things. Maybe there isn't so much of that happening anymore in the pop charts. And I know people talk about it all the time. You know, there's not as much protest going on. I don't know, maybe it'll come back, but you only have to scratch the surface to find out. And Fela Kuti is probably at the top of that pile. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to Bob Marley as well. I always say that. Thanks ever so much for watching. So long, farewell. Au revoir, adios, uh, ciao. Uh, Christian's trying to come in. Uh, Goodbye. Two scenes. Thank you. Bye-bye.